Oh, hey there. Let me ask you a question. How are you doing with your New Year's resolutions? Or would you just rather I didn't ask? Well, as a congregation, we set some goals and some resolutions, and one of them is to have a renewed dedication to personal Bible study. And that's what we're going to look at today. Have you ever thought about just how important Bible study and Bible reading are? Think of it this way. When you eat, do you eat just once a week? Or do you eat throughout the week, many times? Well, it shows on most of us that we eat more than once a week. But for some reason, when it comes to Bible study, that is, eating God's spiritual food, we want to rely on one time a week to feed us. And in fact, I see people who don't even bother to bring a Bible to church or to Bible study. Now, would you let your kid go to school to, say, math class and not have their math book? Well, I don't know any parent or teacher who would stand for that. But for some reason, when it comes to Bible study, we stand for it. Or people who, when they get up and leave to go home, they leave their Bible sitting on the pew next to them. Kind of like the airlines when they used to have those uh, seat occupied signs, like this one here. When you would get off at an intermediate stop, you'd set that in your seat so that hopefully no one took your seat while you were off. Or they go home and the Bible sits in the car. Or they go into the house and chuck it onto the coffee table or the end table. And that's where it sits until uh, next Sunday when they go back to church. You really need to be studying the Bible more. And that's what I want to do with this lesson is show you why you need to be reading the Bible and studying it more. Hey, as Bill Cosby once said, if you're not careful, you might just learn something before we're done. So let's get started. Well, you know, all this talk about eating's made me hungry. So I'm going to go have a sandwich and I'll be right back with you. Well, as we're continuing our look this week, or this month actually, at the various goals that we've set as a congregation, and remember goals are something we need to try and point us in a direction. We don't know where we're going, uh, or we won't know if we've gotten to our destination unless we have some kind of goal set, and that's why we decided to set some of these that we could push ahead towards and we looked a couple of weeks ago at everyone being a minister and that is everybody using your gifts your talents whatever you've got to be able to help the congregation here to grow we've all got a talent we've all got a, a skill something we can use to uh, be a blessing and be a ministry to those here as well as those in our community as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then he, uh, Paul also told the Corinthians that there's a diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. We've all got different uh, ministries, different gifts, and we want to use those in 2018 to grow the congregation. Last week, we looked at adding uh, four new souls. Uh, during presidential campaigns, uh, when the president's running for re-election, you'll hear them chant four more years. Well, we want to do four more souls. And remember, adding four souls wouldn't necessarily stop at just the four because you bring in someone, they've probably got a spouse, kids, uh, other people they could bring into. So it could lead to a lot more than just four souls being added. And today we want to look at renewed dedication to personal Bible study, reading and studying on our own. You notice in uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if you have the old King James Bible, that's the passage that says, study to show thyself approved. And we want to study because we have to be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, notice Peter just said to be ready with that reason. He didn't say your reason will always be accepted. He didn't say that everyone is going to be satisfied with the reason you give, but you need a reason why you believe the things that you believe. Not just because, well, that's what Dad said, or that's what the preacher said, but why do you believe uh, that baptism is by immersion? Or why do you believe the Bible? Let's get even more basic than that. 
And then uh, we're also told to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We can't do that unless we are in diligent personal study uh, of the Bible. And that's what I want us to uh, look at today is why we need to do it. Why is it that we need to be involved in Bible study? Because if there's one thing that uh, you know, I didn't grow up in the church in the 40s and 50s and 60s, but those who were around then tell me that that is when we were really known as a people of the book, that we could give book, chapter, and verse answers. Now, can we still do that? I hope we can. Because that's when someone comes in and says, why do you believe this or that? That's what we really need to be able to give them. Notice when Peter told uh, his readers that like newborn babes, crave a pure spiritual milk so that you may grow in your salvation. Now, when you bring a baby home from the hospital, they tend to want to eat, don't they? Two in the morning, anybody remember waking up two in the morning, having to feed them, get a bottle or, or whatever to feed them? Why? Well, they're hungry. And they don't mind letting you know about it, do they? Well, what about when it comes to God's word? Do we really have that hunger for God's word that, that we need to have? Because when we eat, we don't eat just on Sunday and then go the rest of the week, do we? I mean, most of us, you can tell that we eat more than just once a week. But how come when it comes to our spiritual growth, we eat once a week? Then the rest of the week, we kind of starve ourselves. Sort of like those people in third world countries who are undernourished, they're malnourished. Spiritually, a lot of us, I'm afraid, are malnourished because we're not nourishing ourselves like we need to. Way back in the old days of flying, used to be when planes made uh, intermediate stops, there would be a card you could lay on your seat that said seat occupied. So if you decide to get off and stretch your legs, anybody getting on would know someone was sitting there. A lot of times, we kind of use our Bibles as a seat occupied card. It just sits there when we're gone. It sits in the car and it doesn't uh, come into the house. We don't read it that much. Now, we've all probably got more than one Bible in our house, don't we? And how many of us now have kind of given up the paper and ink copy for maybe it's on our tablet? It's on, I've got them on my cell phone. And I don't know how many versions I've got on my computer. But yet, despite the Bible being available so easily, oh, and cheaply, you can get paperback copies of the Bible for as little as a dollar. But yet it seems like despite the, the overabundance of Bibles and the easy access to Bibles, we seem to be kind of malnourished. We don't seem to be taking as a, the advantage of it that we should. So today, let's look at, at rededicating and renewing our Bible study. Hebrews chapter 5. There the writer says, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. There comes a point in time we need to be uh, feeding others and teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot uh, eat solid food. Babies can't eat solid food. They don't have the digestion. They don't have the teeth for it. And they, they uh, have to uh, uh, be given uh, the milk. So where are we in our, in our uh, spiritual diet? How many of us are still on milk when we need to be on more solid food? I want us to look here, first of all, th that the Bible is necessary for sound teaching. It is necessary for a solid diet. It is absolutely necessary to ensure sound teaching and sound truth because we cannot have absolute truth apart from the Word of God. Without some kind of a standard, then right and wrong and things like that come down to what's right for me may not be right for you. It comes down to just a matter of opinion, matter of one's own feelings. But with the Bible, we've got something we can stand on. We can, we can just go to it, book, chapter, and verse, and there it is. We can have a solid uh, teaching about right and wrong. We can have absolute truth based on what uh, the scriptures uh, tell us. And with all that in mind, we do have to remember that, yes, the word of God has been abused. No question about that. People have abused it. People have quoted it inaccurately. They have misapplied it. But that shouldn't stop us from, from trying to properly understand it, properly use it. Y'all remember, uh, those of you old enough to remember Jim Jones. Remember um, what he did and David Koresh, and we could go down a whole list of organizations as well, the uh, Inquisitions in the Middle Ages, where the Bible has become more of a political club 
to control people with, sure. And there are churches that do control people, sure. They don't want questions asked. I want the questions asked. Am I going to be able to answer every question? No. But you need to be able to ask questions and to think. That's what Christianity is for. It's for thinkers. You've got to be able to study and to ask questions and uh, be able to uh, arrive at an understanding. Do not take my word for it just because I'm standing up here and I've been to a preaching school and I might have all that alphabet soup, PhD, THD, whatever after my name. Don't just take my word for it. Study it for yourself. Learn it. Be able to, uh, to uh, come to some conclusions on your own. Because this is a situation in much of the church today where we are changing, and by we I'm talking everything that people would consider Christendom, we're trying to change things. And we need to remember that uh, if we strip the word of its clear meaning, it becomes secondary authority. Well, you know, society's changed. We want to reach people, so we're going to change our teaching on X, Y, or Z. No, that's not good. You know, if I am reading the Bible and I see, well, the Bible says I need to be doing this, huh? I'm not doing it. Well, I need to change. It's not a, uh, you know, I'm going to change the Bible. That's just, that's changing to try and accommodate uh, people's beliefs and make them just feel good. We can't do that. Sure, I like to feel good. I like to be uplifted, doesn't everybody? But you know, when I go to the doctor, and the doctor told me that uh, she found a lump on my thyroid and I needed to uh, go and get an ultrasound, I didn't feel so good about that. But that's what she needed to tell me. And then, you know, here we're off to the races and eventually I had to have my thyroid out. I wasn't real happy with a lot of the news I was receiving during that time, but I needed to hear it. And there are things in the scriptures that uh, maybe I'm, yeah, that does bother me. But it's probably what I need to hear, too. It's probably what I need uh, to be told to get that clear meaning of scripture. Just like the uh, art enthusiast who uh, had a picture of the Leaning Tower of Pisa hanging in his house. And... You know, there's a reason why it's called the Leaning Tower. But his housekeeper kept taking it and turning it back over to straighten the tower up. He and, and he finally asked her why she did that. And she said, well, I'm just trying to adjust it so the tower stands straight. See, a lot of people want to do that. They want to take the Bible and adjust it so that I feel good, so that my preconceived ideas are upheld, so that <laughs> changes in society... And changes in marriage and all these other things are, are made to acceptable. No, we don't change the Bible. We have to change ourselves. It, it comes back to the doctor. I can't change what the doctor gave me as a diagnosis. I just have to take that information and act on it. We have to take what the Bible says and act on it. And if there's changes that need to be made, we need to make those changes uh, in our lives and not change God's Word. Remember the Bereans? They... they uh, studied what Paul said to make sure what he said was true. Now, here's the thing to think about. They have a divinely inspired apostle sitting there in front of them. Okay, Paul, we hear what you're telling us. Let me see here. Let me make sure. <laughs> yep, okay, checks out what you said, Paul. Looks like it's true. Now, we don't have any divinely inspired apostle. I'm not divinely inspired. You know, God didn't come down to me this morning while I had my coffee and said, here's what I want you to preach on. So, here's my question. If they thought it important to uh, double-check a divinely inspired apostle, how much more uh, important is it for us today to double-check what we're taught? Well, we don't have divinely inspired apostles. Yeah, but he's the preacher. Yeah, he can be wrong. And I'm not saying that because a preacher is wrong or someone that it's mal with malicious intent or to deliberately lead people astray. We sometimes just make mistakes. Debbie's not here, so you don't have to worry about asking her about it. So, but uh, she'll tell you. I sometimes do occasionally make a mistake. Even with all the, the doctorate degrees and things, we can make mistakes. So you've got to make sure that you study it too. Doctors can sometimes make mistakes. Why do you think we're encouraged to get second opinions, third opinions? Sometimes we need to do the same thing. Check it out. Read it for yourself. If you ever get in a situation where you got a preacher, someone who says, oh, don't bother reading it, don't bother checking it out, then you need to get out of that situation. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you don't need to check it out for yourself. Just like when the uh, Secret Service was first created, a lot of people don't realize they didn't protect presidents right away. Their first mandate was to detect counterfeiting. 
when they were established after the Civil War. That's why you'll see them getting involved with credit card fraud and securities fraud and all this other. They spend a lot of time studying what real currency and real securities and things look like. Why? So when a, a, um, a uh, phony, a forgery, a counterfeit comes across, they can spot it. We need to be looking at God's word so that when a counterfeit, a false teaching comes across, we can spot it. We don't have to spend all our time studying what all these other groups teach. Let's just see what the Word of God says, and then we'll, we'll have it down. Yeah, you know, I can't tell you everything this other group teaches, but I know they teach thus and so, and I know that's wrong. And then let's look, too, at the word doctrine, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look over there for just a moment. Chapter 4 of uh, 2 Timothy. Where he says, To preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine or teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned to fables. Doctrine is equivalent to teaching. So when I hear uh, uh, people say, well, doctrine's not that important. Let's not get hung up on doctrine. What they're saying is, let's just not worry about what Christ taught us. Let's just ignore it. You know, Jesus didn't come and inspire the, uh, the uh, New Testament writers to give us uh, all these books of the Bible and write this down just so that we could toss it aside or just to give us kind of a, a guide. It was meant to give us something to build on, not just a guide, but something to actually build on. They're not, he didn't intend them for suggestions, is what I'm trying to say. He intended us to actually follow them and to uh, give them uh, our attention. That's just, but the attitude a lot of people seem to have today is that, uh, you know, we just don't really need to worry about uh, going by what the Bible says. After all, it was written so long ago, so many years ago, so many centuries ago that it's just, it's just gotten old. And so we need to really change and kind of become up to date with society. Well, I think that's why we're having so many of the problems we're having in society. Go back to the Old Testament. Just look at what happened with Israel when they got away from God's Word. And look at what happened when they would uh, actually come on back to uh, what the Word of the Lord has told us. Because Paul has told us that, that we need to watch our life and our doctrine, is what he gave, is the charge he gave to Timothy. Our life and our doctrine. See, when I, when I leave here, it doesn't matter how scripturally sound the Bible lesson is, it doesn't matter how much scripture I know, when I walk out this door, the only Bible some people are going to see is my life. So I need to make sure I'm watching that when I'm outside here, but I also need to make sure I'm watching the doctrine. What, I, what, I, what am I teaching? What am I believing? And then I need to make sure that whatever it is that I'm professing uh, is being played out in my life. It's being played out in everyday uh, living that I'm doing and that hopefully everybody else is doing because what we believe really does matter. Ephesians chapter 4, knowing God's word is the way that we avoid being led astray. That's how, you know, knowing how to get from point A to point B and staying on the road, that's how I uh, can make a journey and do it safely. How am I going to know how to get to heaven? Well, that's where I need to look at what God's Word uh, has to say. It tells us there in Ephesians 4, too, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. You know, I should be firmly, gr uh, firmly grounded. You know, children a lot of times will believe whatever you tell them. But as an adult, I should have a little more critical thinking. And I should be able to analyze and think about things a little more, know God's word so I can avoid uh, being led astray. When someone first comes to being a Christian, whether they're 12, they're 20, they're 30, they're 50, there's still a learning curve there. They may have some Bible knowledge, but there's still going to be a little bit of a curve there where they're going to have to uh, uh, learn more. And they're going to have to, and this is why it's so important when a person does become a Christian, we don't just give them a hug and say, well, uh, here's my phone number, call if you need anything. This is where we really need to step up and help them replace uh, some of these other relationships. Because remember, they're going to leave here and they're going to go home. And that man or woman's going to go home to their spouse, to their parents, to whoever. Hey, I became a Christian. Well, you're not one of those religious fanatics now, are you? They don't get it. 
They're going to go to work tomorrow to the same people. And then that's those same environments. And that's why I think so many, we lose so many of our, of our people that we do win to Christ. is because we're not really stepping up. It's like when we were in children's homes. And we would have a kid come in for three or four months. They're making great progress. They're eating right. They're getting their schoolwork done. They're learning how to take care of themselves. Learning simple things that we might take for granted. Like how to make their bed and organize a closet. That kind of thing. And then all of a sudden they go home for a visit for a week. Well, guess what? Just about everything that we did and accomplished in those three or four months leading up to it just got undone. And many times we had to start over at square one. And that can happen with someone who becomes a Christian. They go back into that environment. So that's where we really have to help them to strengthen them and build them up so that uh, they can continue to build, continue to be edified. And then through that, hopefully we can reach those people that they're going home to and the people they're going to work with. That they can see real change that's taking place. Uh, and then be like, they'll be like babies at first where they are just taking those steps. Remember when your children were standing up and grabbing a hold of the furniture. Or you might hold on to their, their hands and help them walk along. Because they're a little unstable on their feet. New Christians can be the same way. Let's see, why is it again we believe such and such? Or, hey, somebody asked me, and I didn't know the answer to, but why do we do? This is where we can help them learn and understand and be taught more perfectly what the Scriptures tell us. And then let's remember, too, it's necessary for standing strong, uh, studying God's Word. How many of us have had to face a temptation or two? See, that's it, how we stand against the temptations in life. Now remember, what is tempting to you may not necessarily be tempting to me and vice versa. There are some things you can just walk away from that I might have to struggle with. You know, put a cup of coffee and some cookies up here. I'm going to have a little bit of a problem with that one. Some people might have a little bit of a problem walking past some money that's been left lying on a table. The alcohol, you name it. Whatever is a temptation, uh, uh, to you may not be to somebody else. But you know, I've worked a little bit in the insurance business, you know what's the worst time to look and see what your policy covers after the disaster hits? You know, the tornadoes hit, the hurricanes hit, they're calling, hey, am I covered for? I just had an accident or my car got stolen. Do I have coverage for? Well, no, you didn't. Well, I thought I did. Well, no. See, and what's the worst time to find out what my weakness is? After it's hit, after I've given in to the temptation, I need to, to be alert to what my weak spots are, what my temptations are. I need to be alert to what God's Word said about, says about those. We need to be alert for one another, looking out for one another, so that we can build one another up, so that we can all stand firm, so that we can all have our feet uh, firmly planted. Going back to Ephesians 4, we looked at it a little while ago. We are not to be like children being tossed to and fro uh, by every uh, different wind or wave of doctrine. Children growing up, that, that's how they're in their formative years. A new Christian is in, in a formative time. We've got to be mature, got to grow up. I've known people that have been Christians 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They barely know the plan of salvation. They don't take the time to learn it. They don't take the time to grow up. They are spiritually malnourished. And as, as uh, Christians, we need to grow. See, when, when, when you bring a baby home, they weigh six pounds, seven or eight pounds. They grow pretty rapidly, don't they? How is, how is uh, infant clothing sized? Zero to three months, three to six months. Why? Because they grow so fast. Now, if my four-year-old or five-year-old is still weighing 10 or 12 pounds and is only 22 or 23 inches tall, I know something's not right. And I need to get to the doctor and we need to test the hormones, test the nutrition, the DNA, whatever it is to find out what's wrong. Because that's not normal. But yet we seem to accept Christians that are 20 and 30 years who've been Christians a long time being immature in the faith. Oh, that's just normal. That's just how he is. Well, shouldn't we be expecting growth? maturity of, of Christians just like we do of our, of our infants and of our children as they're growing up. See, the Bible is essential to standing against temptations. I have hidden your word in my heart 
Have you got God's word hidden in your heart so that you can stand uh, up to temptation? So you've got the uh, scripture, you, you know that I need to stand. It's not always going to be easy, but I can maybe call a brother or a sister to help me through this time that I'm going through. Maybe someone who's been through the same kind of thing because that regular diet of God's word is going to be our source of growth. It's going to be our source to overcome temptation. It's going to be our source of growing the church, of growing uh, ourselves numerically and spiritually. There is a, a quote that's attributed to Ronald Reagan where he is supposed to have said, within the covers of one single book, the Bible, are all the answers to all the problems that face us today, if only we would read and believe. Now, can you imagine the problems we would be spared if we would just go back to what the Bible says? Look, and again, look at Old Testament Israel. They had their ups and downs. You know, so-and-so became king and reigned for so many years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. It was worse than the guy before him. Then the next king comes along. He reigned for so long and, and did evil in the sight. He was worse than the guy before him. And then eventually you'd get a king who comes along and what's this? Oh, it's the word of the Lord. Why have we not been studying this? Go get the priest. Let's proclaim a fast. Let's, uh, let's get the nation together. Let's read this. Let's get back to it. And then what would happen? Things would turn around for Israel. What do you think that would do? You think that might work for us if we actually got back to what the Bible tells us? Maybe that would solve some of our problems. Maybe we should at least think about it, right? Maybe that would solve some of our issues. And then let's look also at the necessity of a growing faith or how it's needed for a growing faith. Go back and look at it. We looked at Hebrews 5 just a minute ago, where there he tells us uh, that we need to. Uh, by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again. See, if your faith isn't growing, it's dying. When you bring that infant home from the hospital, if they are not growing, something's wrong. Are you growing in your faith? Something's wrong if you're, if you're not growing. Uh, speaking of Ronald Reagan, when he was in his last debate with Jimmy Carter in 1980, he looked into the camera and said, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Let me turn it around a little bit. Are you spiritually more mature now than you were four years ago or even a year ago? We all need to be growing. Every one of us needs to be uh, growing in our faith. And then many people also die spiritually because just of that lack of nourishment. Now, I like to read. I'll read just about anything with uh, uh, ink on it and cover, or that's, you know, on Kindle. And that's great if you like to read, but you know, Reading the novel or reading a good history book is not going to get you to heaven. It's not going to tell you what God's will is. It's getting into the Bible that's going to do it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then Peter again, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Desire this. You should be wanting this just like a newborn baby wants, uh, wants a formula or, or, or a, a mother's milk or, or whatever. You should be wanting that. You should be uh, uh, craving it. And craving a proper diet. Don't just concentrate on one book or one subject, but get a good uh, balance of it. And then, as uh, newborn babes, desire it. Want it, is what he's telling us. And then, here's some tips we want to look at as we uh, uh, get into uh, studying God's Word, as we re re um, carry out this resolution to study God's Word, is number one, have a regular time and place to study, to read. Now, are you someone who's up before everybody else in the house? You're one of these that gets up when it's still dark at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. That might be your time to study. But no, I sleep till noon, but I'm up till 2 or 3 in the morning. Well, okay, maybe midnight is going to be your time. When everybody else is in bed, you can turn the TV off and, and just read. Uh, have a regular time and a regular place. You got your chair in the living room that's your chair and nobody else is allowed to sit there well that might be the place to go or maybe you've got a, a shop out back years ago I read about a lady that she would get up before everybody else in the house and get herself a cup of coffee and up back behind her house was a walking trail and she'd go about a quarter of a mile from the house and there was she said a big old rock sitting there by the side of the trail that was her place to go she would just go and sit on that rock and drink her coffee and read her Bible and have prayer time. 
and watch the sun come up and then go back and get everybody else up and, and get on with the day. You could do something like that or maybe two in the afternoon, whatever is gonna work for you. And then it needs to be a place free of distractions. Now, when I was in school, I wasn't allowed to have the TV on or anything like that when I was doing my math or whatever my homework was. It might be a good idea for when we're trying to read the Bible. No distractions, no TV uh, for 30 minutes or an hour while we're studying it. And then finally, uh, find ways to help you uh, learn to study. Uh, in the old days, before Kindle and all these things came along, a notebook or note cards and a pen or, and a highlighter would be uh, what we would use. Now, I know on Kindle there's ways you can highlight and mark things. I'm not real adept at that, but um, if that's what you're using, then you can mark things that way. Uh, I've got a couple of Bible programs that have got uh, uh, applications where you can make your own study notes there and put them aside. I still am not completely converted to Kindle. Uh, I still like the paper and ink. I still like here where I can put notes in the margin. In fact, I've got a, um, a, a file on my computer I call Things I Learned from Daily Bible Reading. And I look at it and I find something interesting. I make a note. You might see it in a sermon uh, in the future, but you can put things here in the margins or in the center column. Whatever works for you. Find a way to save um, uh, the notes and things that you learn and be able to learn them and memorize them just like you would do with your math or science or anything else in school. Because uh, we do live busy lives. I understand that we've all got things going on, but we've got to take some time out to uh, learn the Bible. And this year to make a renewed effort at studying and learning it, just like we need to make a renewed effort at sharing the gospel with people. We need to make a renewed effort at ministering to one another. So this morning, if you are one who has, uh, needs to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you're one who uh, just needs the congregation to pray with you so that you can uh, get yourself on solid ground, that's what we're here for. And this morning, if you need to renew your dedication to the Lord in any way, to get on, on a straighter path, we would be glad to pray for you and to pray with you. And if we can help you, why not let us know as together we stand and as we sing. We're going to turn to page 659. Will you not tell it today? We are find song in the first verse of that. Thank you very much. See you. That was awesome. If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if this care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of His presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell? 